as we try to meet our targets. Let us be aware of other things that impact on our achieving our targets. What are the security assessments? What is the location for our conferences? How many do we go to before we get back to our sleeping accommodation? These are the things that we consider outside of the conference halls that we get into. I hope that we will all think about what we talk about at the conferences and what we talk about about getting to the conferences. And they all add up in our efforts to mitigate the effects of climate change in the world. I thank you very much. I'm proud to be co-hosting this conference, and I will continue, and I'll, I will uh, encourage my country, my government, or the government of Fiji, to continue to support these, because our very survival in the great Pacific Ocean depends on whether we can turn the clock back and make the ocean blue again for those that live in it, and I whatever. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister, and thank you for your leadership and the leadership of Fiji and all of the other large ocean states of the Pacific. Um, we have the Pacific states to thank for SDG 14, for the Paris Agreement, and now hopefully for a very ambitious uh, strategy at the IMO um, in partnership with many of this in this room. And on that note, I just want to recognize that one of those states, Vanuatu, was just hit with two cyclones and an earthquake, so our thoughts and prayers go out to those people. Um, I would now like to introduce uh, another one of our co-hosts and also the visionary behind the Our Ocean Conference. Um, and the reason that we're all here, U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, Mr. John Kerry. Mr. Kerry. Susan, thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate all your work and the work of all of the uh, NGOs and stakeholders who are here today, we really appreciate it. Appreciate the uh, Navy being here. Uh, and plays a critical role in where we're heading. And I also very much appreciate uh, my good friend from the United States Senate and neighboring state of Rhode Island, Sheldon Whitehouse. Senator Whitehouse is here and really appreciate his interest and efforts. And Mr. Secretary of the Navy, I've told him uh, next to the job I have, that's the best job in the world. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, I, you know, Prime Minister, Rabuka, thank you for your comments and thank you for your wisdom and your commitment to this. I just comment, you're, you're absolutely correct about the questions we have to ask about the choices that we all make. Uh, I know that in the last years, because of my involvement in all of this, obviously, yeah, I've become much more aware and, and uh, uh, I'm fortunate enough to be able to have something of a solar field outside of my home to help feed the electricity and uh, now drive an electric car, which I love, and say to myself, why the hell didn't I start this 10 years earlier? Um, so we have to make those kinds of choices. And, and I recommended to the White House the other day, I walked out of the White House, as I have many times, and and all these big suburbans are out there burning away, just you know, and during the summer and the heat, they're, they're just churning because it creates the air conditioning that keeps, I mean, we can do, we just don't have to do that. I don't know how many of you know it, but there's a Ford 150 truck now, which is electric. It's back ordered for several years. It has all the power and more of a normal, of, of, of an ICE vehicle, uh, internal combustion engine car. And we have the ability now to uh, transition with farm equipment, all kinds of equipment that could have all the power that we need to be able to do the jobs they've done today. People just begin to need to realize uh, these options and choices are indeed actually available to us. And I've, I've had the temerity to suggest that you know the beast, which is what they call the car that the president rides around in, should be electric. Uh, and we ought to be making that kind of transition, and I hope we will. I suspect it, we actually will. I really do. Um, and yesterday I had a chance to chat a little bit with uh, President Cortizo at lunch, and we talked about the possibility. I mean, look, you, you see those enormous 
container ships coming through the canal, which is one of the reasons why we wanted to come here, because this is a great maritime nation it's, it, uh, in so many different ways, not the least of which is it connects the world with the Pacific and the Atlantic and the canal itself, which carries a phenomenal percentage of the world's goods through this canal every year. And so what they charge in terms of the passageway could encompass some kind of a fee on carbon and some kind of a fee reflecting the loads and the size of the ship and the propulsion of the ship and so forth. And he took that on board very seriously and said, you know, it's really worth thinking about that. Obviously, you don't want a price that is prohibitive. You don't want to be, uh, you don't want to be uh, confiscatory. Uh, you just want to be building up a fund that could help you do other things and that isn't onerous. And certainly that doesn't drive people to say, well, we'll go around because you know, it's obviously you know, got to be priced in a smart and intelligent way. But there are all kinds of things that we can do now. And shipping, uh, you know, as I said yesterday, this is not the most complicated challenge in the world in terms of what the problem is and defining it. Uh, you know, this is a battle for air and water and what we're doing to the air and water. And it's not that they're, they're inherently by their, you know, by their uh, structure, the constitution of air and water, it's not that their makeup is the problem, it's what we're putting into it that is the problem. And so we obviously have, have to try to change that. And shipping is right in the nexus between what we do to the air and what we do to the water. And so hopefully we can, uh, uh, given its importance and the scale of the industry is sort of hidden. People don't realize what a big chunk it is. Um, so uh, happily this conference is producing about 377 individual initiatives uh, for ocean, water, climate, the whole nexus, valued at uh, about $20 billion, which is you know, a very significant amount of value that is now being added to the value of the over $100 billion that we've put together over the course of the last seven conferences. And so uh, where we have now probably a total, I think it's a total of about 1,800 different initiatives, which we are, which are real and which we follow and which we're checking up on. Uh, we're also, and I'm just going to put this on the table quickly because people need to understand where we're heading. Um, we're, we're discussing the uh, reality of having some sort of a small, non-bureaucratic secretariat that can take all the knowledge of each of the past conferences and be the repository of that and help each nation that assumes the responsibility for putting this on to work with the community through the year so that there's a greater input and effort for output. And we think this will work. Everybody was unanimous. The 10 countries that are now engaged, Greece and Korea were both there because they're the next. Uh, all agreed that this would be very helpful to this process in order to uh, you know, make sure that it's maximizing the output of these conferences. So um, we all know that shipping generates uh, more greenhouse gases than Germany or Japan. It's a major, major contributor to the problem right now. And we need to be asking the shipping sector to be taking the same kind of steps that we're asking cement or concrete or aluminum or heavy industry of any kind whatsoever, steel production, et cetera. And we're finding as we do this, folks, it's not quite as tough as we've been describing it. Everybody has said for years, oh, those are the tough areas. So they were kind of the orphans of these conferences because everybody said, oh, it's tough. Let's get to the cars first and we'll get to the power sector first. But the truth is we're learning, we're producing green cement and it's better cement, and people are buying it because it's better, not because it's green. So we're gonna find that we'll surprise ourselves, and I think we're already surprising ourselves in a number of sectors, and that's because we keep pushing the curve. But we have to demand more of the shipping sector. 
And it's great to see Maersk here this morning. We're very appreciative uh, for that. Uh, Maersk has been one of our members of the First Movers Coalition, first shipping entity to step up and say that of the next ships we build, uh, eight or nine at, the point, at that point in time are going to be uh, carbon free. And in fact, they're in double digits already and going further because they've decided that's the direction. MSC, Yara, others are, are similarly beginning to grapple with this. Yara are the engine makers uh, and, and people like them, uh, uh, Vartsila, uh, and green hydrogen producers are gearing up to make the green ships and the fuels of the future. And the first of these ships is going to be on the water as early as next year, running on methanol. So for our part, the United States was pleased to join in announcing the Green Shipping Challenge. That's what we put together for COP27. It features more than 40 announcements from countries and companies that's going to help align the industry with the 1.5 degrees. And we're hoping that more people are going to join us in the shipping challenge by COP28 in Dubai. Uh, we're also implementing some of our own changes under the shipping challenge. For example, working with Panama and also Fiji, uh, the Pacific Blue Shipping Partnership, in order to facilitate creating shipping corridors where everything from the port to refueling, to the next step, to final destination are all going to be greened uh, in this process. So these are the first projects under the Green Shipping Corridors Initiation Project uh, that we launched in Sharm El Sheikh. But folks, even these are not going to be enough. Science tells us that without a goal of zero emissions from the shipping sector by 2050, we will not be able to keep 1.5 degrees alive. Shipping is that important. So this is the year that this can start to come together with the scale that it needs to. One big thing needs to happen. The International Maritime Organization must revise its GHG strategy to include the goal of 2050 as its North Star. It hasn't done that yet. It's got to do that. And that will excite the kind of thing I just talked about with respect to the canal or other initiatives where people really begin to drive this forward. If we adopt this goal this year, folks, at the IMO, then I guarantee we're going to see more companies step up, more ships running on methanol, green hydrogen, and green ammonia by the end of the decade. That can and will happen. And think of the downstream supply chain industries and jobs that will come with that transition. Uh, everybody here knows we need to do it, so talk to your, to your leadership to make sure our IMO representatives are all geared up to make this happen, and thank you, Susan, for leadership and putting this together. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Special Envoy Kerry, for your vision and leadership, and I just, um, as an American, I am very happy to see the strong presence here um, from you, from the ambassador, from the senator, from the secretary of the, uh, the Navy, which I think is unprecedented at one of these conferences and really shows us how important and critical these issues are. So thank you all. Um, I would now like to turn from this amazing political leadership to people who are on the front lines of making this transition happen. And as you've heard, it starts with the production of renewable energy. <laughs> and then clean fuels that go into the vessels that create these green corridors. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Jorge Rivera from the, minis the Minister of Energy um, for Panama. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us. Good morning to uh, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here to, to share some of the ideas and the vision that uh, a small country like Panama has to, to put into place uh, in order to help decarbonize shipping. Um, and how, um, what are we going to do? Uh, well, it's, uh, we are going to continue to do what ha we have been doing in the last uh, around 500 years, is to be a place of encounter. Uh, our geography, geo geography sets uh, a lot of uh, our um, uh, task around. And for example, the best way to see it in the last a little bit more than 100 years is the Panama Canal. It's the way to we uh, 
use in a more efficient way the, the, um, our geographical and strategical uh, geographical position. And we will do it continually and in the next uh, uh, decades to go, but in a sustainable way. That's the, 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 the special envoy Kerry and the prime minister have been uh, mentioning a uh, keyword, choices. No? We can say we have a geographical position and we are determined by that, but we have the opportunity to make choices. And Panama has been doing a lot of choices around that in the, uh, in the recent years. And that's the way that we are presenting right now uh, in this uh, conference uh, the preliminary announce of uh, the uh, presenting a national strategy for green hydrogen hub here in Panama in the next, uh, I hope, like uh, two weeks from now to be presented to, to receive feedback from the, from the, from the public. And uh, as I mentioned, this is uh, based in, in the choices that we make, the options, the decisions that we have been doing in the, in the recent years and to be as sustainable. Uh, approach to our already uh, uh, geographical uh, uh, advantages that we have. Um, uh, it's not by a coincidence that, for example, in uh, our national emblem, uh, there's a phrase for the benefit of the world. No, it's signed in our DNA. How do we uh, are this place of, of the world encounters? So uh, we expect to, as a small country but uh, a key country for the global and the regional uh, connection and maritime industry to put in place uh, is this uh, green hydrogen strategy that it has seven uh, pillars, strategic pillars, and w the first one is to uh, develop uh, a specific green hydrogen and derivatives hub here in Panama. Uh, not only thinking about the, the, the way how the we produce the, the, this uh, sustainable or low carbon um, uh, fuels like uh, green hydrogen, ammonia, methanol, etc. But how do you we see the whole cycle of the from the producing to the consuming, as as was uh, 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 special envoy Kerry was mentioning. So we think that there, that's the add the, the value that we add to the, all this process. You now starting with the transformational hub, um, the storage hub, trading hub here in. For the, for the region in the first stage, and of course thinking about the global uh, corridors that we're going to be uh, continue using the Panama Canal. And these uh, pillars are, um, we have you know, uh, the, the construction and the building and the, of, the, of the hub, but also we have uh, the capital uh, needed, investments, uh, uh, assignments, the human resources, uh, uh, education and capacity building, the regulatory and the incentives and, and policy initiatives. Uh, and we have been doing, uh, performing and, and, and formulating these initiatives aiming to 2030, aiming to 2040 and 2050, you know, aligned with the, uh, our own commitments from, from, for the Paris Agreement, uh, the SDGs, and of course right now uh, I am glad to announce that also with the, our oceans uh, platform. We already <coughs> uh, upload and, and present formally uh, one of the four pilot projects that we are uh, 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 presenting within this strategy. It's uh, the transformational plant. It's uh, a commitment of $500 million project already uh, in this platform. So uh, we think that uh, in the next uh, few uh, years, uh, we can fulfill with the need of the investment from the private sector to fulfill and to develop all these um, initiatives. Uh, we serve the, the world shipping industry, uh, mainly with the, the Panama Canal, but there's a lot of uh, auxiliary and uh, related activities around the Panama Canal, the ports around the Panama Canal, and we think that with that, one of those uh, activities and services is the bunkering service that we provide to the vessels that crosses the canal right now. So we wanted to, to improve that bunkering activity that we already been doing in a sustainable way with the green hydrogen and derivatives, and we expect by 2030 that at least 5% of that green 
uh, bunkering offer that we, we have here in Panama comes from green hydrogen and derivatives. And we expect by 2040 that this 5% comes up to 30%. And by 2050, that 30% comes up to 40%. Of all the, the, the bunkering activities we are uh, offering here in, in Panama will come from renewable um, uh, 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 fuels. So we think that the, that's the vision that we have, no? the choices that we make, the decisions that we make. Panama is a, green, uh, a carbon negative country. We have to keep pushing that, uh, in that leadership around the world. Our energy matrix comes like from above 80% of uh, renewables right now, and we expect to climb up that to 90% in the next uh, uh, seven years. So we think that we have the conditions, we have the, you know, the natural resources, but we have the ability and the, the willingness to do this in a sustainable way, and we are, we are going to do it together. You now we think that uh, this is something that we uh, keep telling ourselves and the stakeholders that we work on here in the, our, our national energy transition agenda. That's that uh, actually this strategy is, formed, is part of that uh, a broader uh, national uh, energy transition agenda. And as we keep saying, you know, you don't wait for the future. You build the future with the decisions you're making and we are doing it together right now. Thank you very much. Thank you for those very inspiring words, Dr. Rivera. And, and just to say, I mean, Panama, I think you were very modest. Panama may be a small country, but it is a maritime powerhouse. And so as Panama's vision and leadership um, goes, I think we will see a lot of other countries follow. Um, and so I'm very excited that, uh, to see your vision. Um, I would now like to introduce uh, the man who I think many have referred to <laughs> a little bit here, um, but the man who has the job of, at the international level, um, making sure that this vision is also um, implemented and, and really bringing his vision to this work. So uh, it is my honor and privilege to introduce the Secretary General of the International Maritime Organization, Mr. Kitak Lim. Prime Minister, the Special Envoy, Ministers, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure to provide a framing remark at this side event on the decarbonizing shipping. Maritime transport continues to be the most economic and environmentally sustainable mode of transportation for a large volume of cargoes. This is a certainty even in uncertain times. As the global regulator for shipping, I am continue to ensure maritime sector delivers global trade safely, securely, efficiently, and sustainably. Next Monday, we will mark the 75th anniversary of the adoption of IMO Convention, which establishes this organization. As we continue on shipping's journey, toward sustainability, shipping must embrace decarbonization alongside the digitalization, innovative technology, all the while ensuring human element is a kept front in the center of the technological transition. <coughs> As the whole world <coughs> unites for fight climate change, the biggest challenge facing shipping is reducing its greenhouse gas emission. Next five months are crucial to ensure IMO showcase its global leadership toward the efforts to decarbonize shipping. We must lead the way and provide the global framework for the maritime industry to strive for green shipping and at the same time, we must ensure we leave no one left behind. As you are aware, I am a member state are currently actively engaged in the process of upgrading IMO's initial strategy on reduction of GHG emission from ships, which was adopted initially 2018, but we are working for to upgrade the strategy in this July. The revised strategy containing a basket of technical and the economy major will provide the necessary certainty for all stakeholders to invest for future. 
fuels and the ships related technology setting the way toward decarbonizing shipping. I believe IMO member state must be ambitious and the bold enough to upgrade the vision and the level of ambition toward 2050. Take into account the message from the latest IPCC climate report to achieve the goal set in the Paris Agreement. IMO is alongside working to support the member states in their implementation of major agreed to ensure no one is left behind in transition toward decarbonized future for shipping. I see great opportunities for many countries to be a part of the new green future that will see low and zero carbon fuels being produced and supplied globally, but also from retrofitting ships and digitalizing port operations. Knowledge sharing is critical to the attainment of our common objectives. We can all learn from each other. I am ready to support this process. Time is act is now. Ladies and gentlemen, at this pivotal time in history, shipping is undergoing complex and substantial changes. By working together, collaboratively and cooperatively, we can harness this transition to make shipping greener, more resilient, more efficient, more sustainable for the benefit of all. I'm very glad to be here taking this opportunity of the Our Ocean Conference in collaboration with the decarbonizing effort. I think it gives a huge benefit, huge leverage to decarbonize shipping as well. I am all, uh, we don't have much time, so working very hard. We have a working group this month and the main meeting in July. So all I'm a member state, together with the industry, we will do our best to contribute effectively effort of global effort for decarbonization of shipping. Thank you. Thank you, sir, Mr. Secretary General. Um, thank you for your leadership in bringing the first GHG strategy into existence and for the leadership that you are showing and the hard work that you and your team are putting in. And uh, again, I echo your call that everyone in this room, the member states, the ambitious stakeholders, um, let's be get behind this and you know, we don't have a lot of time until July, um, but now is the moment. Um, so what does this look like on the ground, or in the water, I guess I should say, and in the policy halls? Uh, to answer that question, I am going to turn over to my colleague, Jan Krzysztof Napierski, who is the head of regulatory policy at the Maersk McKenney Muller Center for Zero Carbon Shipping. Uh, Jan Krzysztof, you have the floor, and he will bring up an amazing panel of people to tell you what this looks like. Thank you very much, Sue, and thank you all for being here in this room. I think this is fantastic to see so many key stakeholders along the value chain gathered here in this room to speak about the decarbonization of shipping and how we achieve our targets. And um, maybe one word from my side, I'm from the Merce McKinney Bella Center for Zero Carbon Shipping, and our approach is looking at two things. If asked, well, how do you decarbonize shipping? One is bottom up, show it is possible that we can decarbonize along the whole value chain, put some demonstration projects out there. And therefore, the countries represented in this room are so important. Second, a top-down approach. Use policy measures to demonstrate it is possible to upscale these solutions to the volumes we need globally. And therefore, the zero by 2050, as mentioned before, is absolutely key. With these words, I'm very, very happy and proud to present three panelists that come exactly from the elements we need here, from the public sector and the private sector. So allow me to welcome US Deputy Special Envoy for Climate, Sue Binias, to welcome President of MERSC, Central America, Andina, and the Caribbean Sea, Antonio Dominguez, and Executive Director of the Sustainable Shipping Initiative, Andrew Stevens. Please take place in. Sue, 
allow me to start with you. Looking one year back, I had the pleasure to be on Palau, and that was my first Our Ocean Conference, and it was deeply inspiring. And what a journey in just the last year on the decarbonization of shipping. One of the major initiatives that was already mentioned, Palau, and then really broadly communicated was the Green Shipping Challenge of the United States. And uh, it has sent a strong signal to public and private sector on the decarbonization. I would like to ask you, how has actually the response been from the sector to the Green Shipping Challenge? And how do you see the role of policymakers on the way forward? Thank you. Can you hear me okay? All right, thanks for that question. Um, I recall about a year ago, Susan asked me <laughs> in a small classroom in Palau, uh, what's the future, what should we be doing about decarbonizing the shipping sector? And I said something like, the international shipping sector needs its own our ocean moment. And I think that catalyzed for us what we needed to do um, moving forward and on the road to COP27. So. Um, in May, we talked to our Norwegian friends and we sort of concocted this idea of a green shipping challenge. We took two of the declarations from Glasgow. There was the Clyde Bank Declaration on green shipping corridors, and then there was the zero emissions from shipping declaration. And we sort of combined those into one idea, elaborated them, and then went around kind of shopping <laughs> for uh, supporters, volunteers. Over the summer, we raised it at the Major Economies Forum, which uh, President Biden held at the leader level, and we got quite a bit of support from the major uh, individual members of the Major Economies Forum on the road to uh, COP27. Ultimately launched the challenge at a high-level event at COP27. Some of you may have been there, and we were kind of surprised at how good a reception we got at the our Sharm El Sheikh, our ocean green shipping moment. Uh, we got uh, at least 40 commitments, not only from governments, but from the private sector, from NGOs, from ports. Very interesting combination of, uh, of actors. Um, some of the examples, we got investments in next generation vessels, such as a commitment for 200 new sail-powered cargo ships by 2035. We got announcements on the production of zero emission fuels, such as new partnerships to build the first e-fuel hubs. We got announcements on the development of new green shipping corridors. We already had one between Los Angeles and Shanghai. We got another one between Los Angeles and Singapore. And we made several announcements about what the United States uh, itself or ourselves were doing. Uh, a bunch of new commitments, the first US maritime decarbonization strategy, a number of initiatives related to green shipping corridors. Um, for example, three new bilateral work streams, one with Korea, one with Canada with respect to traffic on the Great Lakes, and one with the UK. Um, we announced with partners in the uh, zero emission shipping mission, the launch of a green shipping corridor hub, which is a, we think, a useful online platform with resources and tools to aid the creation of green shipping corridors around the world. And we launched our green shipping corridor initiation project, which is basically money to support feasibility studies for green shipping corridors involving uh, developing countries. And just yesterday, and Secretary Kerry alluded to this, we announced that we're partnering with both Panama and Fiji and the Pacific Blue Shipping Partnership on the first projects under this uh, initiative. This year we're gonna be working on Green Shipping Challenge 2.0, and so everybody should look forward to that. We'll be doing some kind of event at <coughs> COP28 in, uh, in Dubai, and I just wanted to second uh, or third <laughs> the notion that we really need a positive, ambitious outcome at the IMO in July, critically important, particularly since those emissions are not covered by most countries' NDCs under the Paris Agreement, which I think is a fact that often goes uh, unnoticed. It's, uh, those are like uh, additional emissions, about 3%. Uh, we were successful last year at ICAO 
uh, coming up with the 2050 global goal for international aviation, and we need to do the same thing this year with respect to uh, maritime emissions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sue, and uh, that is a clear proof of how much has happened just in the past year and month, and I'm very much looking forward to what's going to happen in the next month, especially on the pathway to July. But going from public now to private, and Antonio Mursk. Many perceive you as being an icebreaker from the private side on the decarbonization of shipping. But many also ask, why do you do it? Does it actually make sense to, to do this as, uh, as an icebreaker? And what is actually the benefit for, for your customers and yourself in this? Because clearly there is a lot of costs in the beginning connected to this. So happy if you could share some of your insights. Thank you. Thank you for the question, first of all, and glad to be here. I think that we are all leaders in this room. By definition, leaders lead. They set a vision, they lead the way. They, they make things happen. You need to make the impossible possible. That's what a leader does. And when, when we see what is happening in shipping, we cannot shy away from the responsibility. There's a bunch of excuses out there, you know, there's a chicken and the egg dilemma. Should we need for the fuels to be developed before ordering the vessels? We don't order vessels because there is no fuel. There's a lot of excuses. But when we talk to our customers, when we talk to our family members, they need action. They need leaders to lead the way and show actions now. But if something is certain, is that the pandemic has showed us that actually the emission of gases went up, not down during the pandemic. And I explained that to uh, students and schools, it's very easy. If you are driving your car faster, are you getting more emissions or less emissions out of that car? The faster you go, the more emissions that engine will produce. It's the same in shipping. If we are all having congestions in ports, if you cannot get your cargo out, if you need to rush from one port to the next, of course there will be more emissions. So when Mer decided to go ahead and in 2018, said we're not going to buy any new vessel until we understand what's the new fuel. That was not an easy decision. That took a lot of courage because there was not new fuel out there. So we went into actually researching and understanding what could be that new fuel. And there was not a single fuel out there that could replace fossil fuels. But there was something certain in our minds. We will not go for trans, uh, transitional fuels. We will not go into LNG. Because that's also fossil fuel. We need to find something clean, something green. So after four years of research, we came out with a solution that it will be on ammonia, on methanol, on alcohol. And then it comes the moment of truth. Do you believe in your recommendation? And we put $2 billion behind that. And we ordered nine vessels first, special envoy, and then 12, and now 18 methanol vessels. This big mammoth that you will see in the ocean in 2024. There is one coming out this year already. A big feeder being in, uh, in Europe to show that it could happen. It will be in the water for a couple of months. And guess what? When we order those vessels, then we open a new market for the production of methanol. I'm glad to report that when we ordered those vessels, there was not a single company out there who were able to produce methanol for one vessel, not 12. Now we have signed agreements with seven companies to produce that methanol. We need 45,000 tons of methanol per vessel. We have 730 vessels, second to the US Navy. <laughs> <laughs> so what our customers are saying is you are in the right way. We, we constantly talk to our customers. We make these meetings with our customers. We approach the 200 top customers of MERS globally, and 189 of them are ready to demand that companies serving them will have a green policy. That's why MERS has decided that we're not going to wait 2050. MERS will decarbonize our entire network in 2040. And that's not only shipping, because we are a, we are a logistics company. We are beyond the ocean. We have airplanes, we have warehouses, we have, we have 500 warehouses around the world. We have trucks, we have railways. We're going to decarbonize the entire ecosystem of MERS in 2040. We'll be completely net zero in a couple of years. Thank you.
Thank you very much. And uh, it's an enormous task. Being myself from, from Denmark, one remark on this. The first 12 ships, the energy to produce the fuels, if it were to come from Denmark, it would suck up all the green energy produced in Denmark, just for the 12 ships. So the energy question is super important. And before the initiative, many ask, demand, supply, what's coming first? I think the answer is very clear. There is a lot of demand coming. Now we need to look at the supply. And with this, let me also then go directly over to Andrew Stevens and Sustainable Shipping Initiative, because another key factor here is also the crews, the staff on the ships, and a number of other men that play into it. We see a lot of positive commitments from the shipping sector, apart from Maersk. And uh, your members have a, created a roadmap to sustainable shipping that calls for zero by 2050. It also calls for improving resilience in the sector and ensuring the training of seafarers. And seafarers are absolutely key. Some claim that we will need 800,000 well-trained new seafarers by the middle of the next decade. So there is an enormous task in front of us. How is it good for business, actually, to do this? Please enlighten us. Thank you, Jan Christoph. Uh, interesting question and, and great backdrop there. Um, what's, what's for sh sure is that we see the growing demand for sustainability is coming from all angles, uh, as you've also been hearing probably over the last day or so. The COZEV initiative, for example, is showing demand from major cargo owners who commit to decarbonizing their own maritime freight by 2040 and call for full decarbonization in shipping by 2050. Shipping represents scope three emissions for most industries, so it's a win-win to be addressing these. SSI has been around since 2010 and the conversation around decarbonization has really converged on the way forward in the past two years. But we are now seeing the beginning of a shift away from carbon tunnel vision to a more systemic view of the transition that shipping needs to undergo. Thinking of the roadmap, vision areas such as oceans and biodiversity, communities, people, transparency, finance and energy. These are all key factors in facilitating the pathway to a decarbonized, sustainable, and resilient maritime sector, which is aligned with the Paris Agreement goal of limiting warming to below 1.53 degrees Celsius. Good for business can be interpreted in different ways, and there are certainly companies that stand to gain from being early adopters of sustainable solutions. Maersk is one example of a first mover in this space. At the same time, Good for Business is becoming a license to operate in an ever-changing world with planetary and social boundaries to take into consideration. One clear example of this is seafarers' rights, where the companies that are operating below minimum standards will be pushed out of the market if they continue and do not improve their practices. But shipping's energy transition is not about competitive advantage. It's about securing a future and creating resilient supply chains that can continue to enable global trade. Without mitigating action and adapting to these impacts already seen because of climate change, it will become more difficult to operate in the future. Just looking at ports, the majority are exposed to natural hazards such as cyclones, earthquakes, and flooding, as we have heard earlier this morning, tragically, for Vanuatu. With 63.1 billion US dollars of global trade at risk annually, particularly in those small island developing states. Some will say that we cannot afford to do this, and ship owners operate daily with small profit margins, markets that are constantly in a state of flux and volatility. But the real question for all of us is can we afford not to? Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. And 
thank very much. Thank you all uh, for, for your remarks here. I think that was a very strong plea for a strong private and public partnership on the pathway to decarbonization, both for the concrete projects and for the policy that is needed. And uh, with this, I'm happy to pass on the mic again to Susan for some closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you all so much for those remarks and for really just making very tangible and clear what is happening and what we can be doing. So we're a bit over time. I'm just going to give three things that I heard. Um, great panel. Thank you all so much. It's been amazing. Um, the first thing I'd say is July is a really important moment. <laughs> we, you know, we really need to get this right at the IMO. We have an opportunity to set a trajectory that will be 1.5 aligned to zero by 2050 in this sector. Um, and so we should all rally around that because that will help to set the stage for all of this amazing work. Um, and that that is an enforceable path, which I think we don't often get in the ocean world. So we should take advantage of that. Um, second is we need the full value chain to be part of this. Um, Mr. Minister, thank you so much for coming because I think it shows from the very production of those green and uh, renewable fuels, renewable energy, renewable fuels, all the way through we need to be part of this. And the, the great news is we have that full chain here um, to make this happen. Uh, cargo owners, demand from shippers, from ports, from communities, so we can make this happen. And the third thing is there is a path for this so-called hard to abate sector to be a model for how we can transition the sector, not just for mitigation and be on a 1.5 aligned path, but also for resilience, for a just and equitable and resilient transition, because all of these pieces have to work together. So I'm energized by this panel. Thank you all so much. Um, and let's go forward and do good work.